Well, beloved, one of the most important things we can do with a biblical text is to acknowledge the fact that it is literature. While as Christians we do affirm that the Bible is the word of God, Christianity has held that the word is mediated through human authors. And as the work of human authors, it contains varied types of literature. It contains poetry and prose and saga and folktale and mythology and history. And we get a good example of two different types of biblical literature that are kind of crammed together in the gospel reading this morning. The parable of the sower is undoubtedly one of the best known parables in the New Testament. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and John, and it's very familiar to most people. But what we heard today as one reading are actually two separate literary units. If you look at the citation in your bulletin, you'll see that seven verses are skipped in the middle. The first unit is the parable itself, And the second is an allegory based on that parable. Many New Testament scholars note the difference between the two and postulate that the allegory might have been added later by the church of the author of Matthew. What is apparent is that the parable and the allegory have different emphases and that each one is worthy of almost separate consideration. And this is part of the richness of scripture. You can contrast the two by thinking of the difference between parable and allegory in the works of two of my favorite authors, who, gosh, I haven't mentioned in a long time, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Tolkien's works are parables. His point was to weave a story which reflected his beliefs and thoughts as a very devout Christian, influenced by the writings of ancient northern languages and their cultures. So in his works, you can compare elves to angels, hobbits to Englishmen, etc., etc., But Tolkien never states this overtly. They're parallels that the reader draws themselves. And it's less distinct. There are aspects of Christ in Frodo and Sam and Aragorn, Gandalf, all the different characters. And people, since its writing, have drawn comparisons between uh, the One Ring and atomic weapons, modern industrialization, 20th century fascism. But Tolkien never intended any of these directly. He insisted that the process of people finding their own attributions was correct, though, a process he called applicability. And this is why Tolkien's stories endure in popularity, despite the fact that most of the fictional works written at the same time as his have now lapsed into academic obscurity. His readers read his stories and find parallels to their own experience and belief. And it's the same with Jesus' parables. The fact that we don't know whether Jesus or the disciples or the sowers, what exactly the seed is, or what the different types of soil are, leaves the parable open for interpretation in a wide variety of contexts. And this reflects an ancient Jewish idea of scripture. A scripture is a gem that you can turn and turn and turn, and each time you turn it, you see a different facet or value in the same piece of scripture. Scripture only has this value if you treat it as literature something that can be wrestled with, taken apart, and examined. Now, allegory is a different thing. In allegory, things are given a one-to-one correspondence, and a good example of this is C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. In the Chronicles, you can tell the obvious links. Aslan is God. The White Witch is Satan. It's an allegorical story. Specific meanings are locked to parts of the story that provide a single interpretation with obvious meaning. Now, Tolkien didn't like this kind of storytelling. He once said he disliked allegory wherever he could smell it. And the reason, he said, was it locks down a story to a specific culture and time and narrows its universality. And that's why I would venture to say that while both Tolkien and Lewis's works are popular, Tolkien's works are far more popular outside of the English-speaking culture than Lewis's are. They have a mythological value that transcends culture. And this is probably why people are more familiar with the parable in our gospel than the allegorical interpretation. The focus of the parable is the harvest. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. In the parable, the types of soil are mentioned, but there's kind of this natural building, the path, the rocky ground, the thorns, and finally the good soil, which seems to spring out of the narrative with excitement. This is the point of the parable, the harvest, a harvest of a hundredfold, 60 or 30. Now, a first century harvest would have been about seven to tenfold, and a 30-fold harvest is considered really good in modern agriculture. So any of these harvests, the hundred, the 60, the 30, are all out of proportion to the work of the sower, whether we read the sower to be Jesus or to be us. The sower sows and waters, but it's only God that can make the harvest so impossibly large. 
So my take on the parable is that it's all about the wonder of God's abundant mercy. The allegory has a different emphasis. The allegory is interested in the different types of soil. It's designed to make the listener ask, what kind of soil am I? Do I not hear the word at all? Do I hear it and then fall away? Am I lured by the wealth of the world or do I hear and understand? And it seems to me that this this reflects a natural tendency in the journey of faith. We hear a message of incredible abundance and unbelievable grace, but then we feel that we're holding something back. We desperately want to feel the all-encompassing abundance of the harvest of God, but we know that there's something not quite right. We have the sneaky suspicion that the seed has not fallen in the right soil. But we can't stretch this metaphor until it breaks. It's quite often a problem in religion as you you stretch a metaphor until it no longer applies. This isn't an argument for predestination, although I'm sure, sure some would read it that way. We're not one type of soil and destined to stay that way. Instead, the allegory is supposed to help us continually measure how we're responding to the abundance of God. Are we bearing good fruit? So this passage in its two portions points the hearer in two very different directions. The allegory points the hearer inward, focusing on our own relationship with God. The parable points us outward, reminding us of the power and grace of God. And both are important points in the Christian life. But often in our culture, I think we're focused on the allegory. Religion is for us, especially in Wisconsin, a very personal thing, something we don't talk about publicly. We generally see it as something to guide our personal moral lives. But that's not what we see going on in the parable. If we put God as the sower, we see a crazily abundant God sowing seed everywhere, in places that it's never going to to sprout. The seed crosses borders, it goes everywhere, the past, the rocks, the thorny ground, the fertile field. And despite that, the harvest springs up. Some of it prospers more than others, but even the minimal harvest, in any case, is beyond belief. The parable calls us to see the world in a different way as Christians, not as one bounded by scarcity, but as one defined by a generous bounty from a loving God. And the hard part is that Jesus expects us to actually live this way. So many voices in our culture today are trying to convince us that we live in a time of scarcity. They tell us we have to hold tightly to what is ours, whether it's food or land or security or even cultural identity. And we're told to fear the other, despite the fact that we live in arguably the most abundant and safest time in human history. It's really hard to square that vision with the one of the crazy sower throwing seed everywhere. And ultimately, we have to make a choice as to how we see the world. Is it the world of the hoarder or the world of the sower? Jesus calls us to the harvest, an abundant harvest of God's love and reconciliation for a hurting world. It begins with us. Let anyone with ears listen. Amen. Amen.